Good evening. My name is Alexander Hagen. I am the CEO of a small, medium-sized tech company in Silicon Valley. Previously, I was a financial analyst and a financial journalist. Tonight, I want to speak to you about the foreign policy presidential debate and the presidential debates in general. Um, these presidential debates in this election uh, were a very important one to allow other voices into. The debates have been pablum. There's been very little substantive difference between the two candidates. Some would argue with me, uh, but please bear me out. <clears throat> so after the foreign policy debate was over, I listened to the NPR analysis, and one of the analysts said um, that there was very little substantive difference between the two candidates, and the difference is more one of tone of style. What the devil does that mean? And why, in such a situation, would we deny Jill Stein of the Green Party and Gary Johnson of the Libertarian Party and others a voice in a debate that's incredibly boring and provides no new ideas? I don't really care who won. That's a distraction. The question is, what was established? What's new? Where are we going? And in my view, it's a more of the same. <clears throat> So the first thing I noticed is that Obama claimed that the um, opinion of the United States in the Middle East and Arab countries has improved due to our partnerships with Yemen, Somalia, and Pakistan, or somewhere. Uh, but if you actually look at opinion polls, uh, uh, the uh, view of the United States has gone straight down since Obama's Cairo speech three or four years ago. Uh, the Libya invasion was uh, posed by... 10 out of 10 Arab countries polled by Gallup. And none of these hard questions was asked, nor were they answered. In the case of Romney, Romney backpedaled from his master race position of American exceptionalism from his book, America, No Apologies, after we've intervened and uh, toppled governments uh, all to bad effect in Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Afghanistan, uh, Iran, the Congo, uh, uh, propped up South Africa, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. There's a lot to apologize for. Um, and there's a, a lot that Romney apparently doesn't know or has whitewashed in some bizarre way. I call it the master race position, American exceptionalism and Romney. The neocon racist position. Nationalist is actually more accurate, but it sounds too pleasant. So Romney uh, acts quite reasonable. Peace, 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 peace. Of course, that really means war, 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 war. More on this idea momentarily. <clears throat> this is freely understood that there is no substantive difference. In 2008, the difference between the positions of Obama and McCain were stark. Unfortunately, Obama did not actually implement any of his arguments. So in 2008, the need for a third-party candidate in the debates wasn't so great because Obama was articulating positions that were starkly in contrast to McCain's. Whichever one you can reverse it, McCain was articulating positions starkly in opposition to Obama. We had two real clashes of ideas. However, Obama ended up not embracing his own ideas. There was no help for homeowners massive transfers of wealth to the banks, no serious investigations, and now also, have any of these questions been really seriously asked? Maybe one or two obliquely, but they should be held accountable. So there was uh, no help for homeowners. I myself was in a, a problem with my mortgage and tried to go through the HAMP program and found out uh, you know, a mere handful of people got modifications through that program. I mean, less than I could have probably organized with a couple of philanthropists here in the Bay Area. Um, then there was no serious investigations leading to real jail time for people who had misused not billions of dollars, but trillions of dollars. I mean, there is an entire, the entire uh, uh, banking sector of the top 1%, you could probably put 10% of them in prison um, if you had serious investigations. Why wasn't this done? Why wasn't this asked? And there was a complete collapse of any even pretense that this wasn't a rigged game in the case of the LIBOR scandal. The LIBOR rate, the London Interbank uh, rate, uh, is a rate that determines contract interest rates worldwide. And it was uh, the banks 
deliberately understated how much money they uh, it cost them to borrow money. So they also manipulated it upside as well. So they were taking something that uh, involved uh, cheating on trillions of dollars of transactions. And most people say this, that means that the central banks had to be involved. So you could literally uh, uh, be investigating the people who run the Federal Reserve as well, Tim Geithner. These people colluded in manipulating interest rates, which is like shaving points on a, a ball game. Um, uh, that's RICO, the Racketeer Influenced Corrupt Organizations. Our banking system is a racketeer influenced and corrupt system. No one's been put in jail. Nobody. Yet we have two million people in prison in the United States, the largest prison population in the world. Um, but these people are all uh, apparently at the bottom. As one lawyer once told me, I see if I can do this for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. How much justice can you afford? Then there was the issue of the poorly executed stimulus. <clears throat> The, in my view, the stimulus, and I was very surprised. I called them, I contacted them. Why was the SBA not funded, the Small Business Administration? The best, because why pick winners and losers? Why not just make uh, loans available? Then also, we would still have the money. They'd be loans. Um, and I posed this back in the beginning of 2008 and said, let's do some SBA loans. SBA loans were a pittance compared to the $700 billion stimulus, which picked winners and losers. The government gave money to your competitor. If you didn't apply for a, a, a stimulus loan, you were in danger of finding suddenly the guy next to you with a huge stack of money, plus the government wants him to succeed because it's their jobs on the line, so you get connections. I found this out because uh, I did some stimulus applications, and most small companies were just a ace out because if you didn't have connections it was too hard to work the process it was very difficult uh, I had to do an application with over a thousand pages of documentation and still was deemed incomplete there was no attention to minorities African Americans particularly under Obama and I don't think anybody would have thought that would have happened um, and this I think was referred to uh, I didn't see anything about it in the debates um, then Obama was held to the fire recently by a, uh, a Hispanic journalist saying, um, you promised you were going to do something about immigration reform and you didn't do it. And then Obama does this thing where he bats his eyes and he says, well, you know, I can't, um, I didn't promise I would 100% be able to implement all of my policies. And the last minute, he put an executive order allowing um, certain uh, immigrants to be able to stay in the country, but only if he's president. Because as an executive order, if Romney becomes president, they have no protections. So he's enslaving all minorities that qualified for his program to only vote for him. Because if anybody else gets elected, they lose their reprieve. So it's an evil form of immigration reform. I wouldn't say that it was on the first year of his uh, of his candidate of, of his uh, uh, term because that would be four years people could put their lives together and it would be difficult to revoke it. But in the election year, uh, that looks pretty shoddy to me. Um, not having the, the you know, fortitude to go to Congress and have a real discussion about it, and then, then perhaps to do an executive order at least. But no, it was a very cynical manipulation in my view. Or, you know, a last minute, throw it in the luggage before you get on the plane. <clears throat> He, uh, Obama made claims he was going to fight back against unbridled centralized power, uh, close Guantanamo, and respect the Constitution. When in fact, all of these uh, sinister things were kept in place. Uh, Guantanamo is open, more and more national security laws, and I'll get to this in more detail later. So he did nothing to help us with our civil liberties. Then he gave us the impression that marijuana law enforcement would not be a priority. But here in California, we've seen a lot of pop clubs shut down. And in my view, legalizing and regulating drugs uh, eliminates violence associated with them. And it eliminates people who make poor choices ending up with criminal records, making it harder for them to fit into society and multiplying our miseries. And he actually has been very aggressive on marijuana law enforcement. Uh, which 
is uh, in contradiction to what he said on the campaign trail. Glenn Greenwald called him Bush on steroids with his massive drone program. Uh, others, including Greenwald, have said that Obama has the severest, uh, uh, he has the most severe, I beg your pardon, one moment, please. Uh, he has the most severe attacks against whistleblowers by any administration. People in the military who had expressed support for WikiLeaks were considered to potentially be aiding a terrorist organization, making them equivalent uh, legally of uh, joining Al-Qaeda to simply su express support for uh, whistleblowing. Um, and uh, there were no investigative questions about the use of a peacekeeping resolution in Libya to be used to create a war. Uh, driving neutrals away from NATO, people forget what the neutral means because we live in a, in, a, in a unipolar world now, but in the old days, the neutrals are countries that weren't siding with the Soviet Union or with the U.S. Well, we have different power structures in the world now. We have Brazil, Russia, India, China. Uh, we have uh, Europe. We have the developing Asian countries. So there are such things as neutrals. There are such things as countries that could be pulled into various orbits of influence. And what we did in Libya will drive neutrals away from us and into the hands of countries that don't have histories of invasion. China has no, uh, hasn't invaded anybody. India hasn't invaded anybody. They've had a border skirmish with Pakistan um, and border skirmish probably with China over Tibet or nearly so. Brazil's never invaded anybody. So why wouldn't you throw your lot in with, with uh, less warlike countries? Um, especially when you see what happens to the leader of a country who had voluntarily disarmed. Oh, Gaddafi gave up his WMDs for improved relations with the U.S. That really did him a lot of good. So there were no real questions asked, in my view, and no real answers given, and no other voices allowed. A giant echo chamber for people living in a bubble. The journalists live in the bubble, the politicians live in the bubble, um, and the 1% uh, lives in the bubble, and no one's allowed to pop the bubble, that's for sure. <clears throat> Be now, the reason I say this is because uh, these were not perceived as areas where the candidates had substantial disagreement, and these critical issues were ignored. They were ignored because if you went through this list, Obama and Romney um, didn't have enough differentiation in their product lines for the journalists to pursue the questions because the journalists weren't willing to hold them to account. They were um, just throwing out the standard talking point type questions uh, in broad, vague terms without good research, without real punch, and uh, the softballs were uh, bunted around. <clears throat> That's my view on the matter. Are not the basic freedoms enshrined in our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, that are being taken away from us important enough to be asked about in the presidential debates? Had a third party candidate, such as Gary Johnson of the Libertarian Party, who's the inheritor of Ron Paul's mantle, in my opinion, and I intend to vote for, because in California I don't have the right to vote for president, because I'm in a winner take all state that always votes Democratic. So my vote is worthless. If you live in Texas, you're in a state that's going to vote for Romney come hell or high water. So your vote is worthless. And um, so, of course, I'm going to vote for Gary Johnson as a protest vote. And I suggest anybody not living in a swing state do so. And um, because uh, Romney uh, will continue to drive uh, the... Uh, I'm not voting for a billionaire unless he's a genius. Um, I think he's out of touch with real people's problems. I don't care if he's better, even if he was better than Obama, I'm not voting for a guy born billionaire. Um, and uh, so if you're living in a swim state, I would suggest you vote for Obama, I suppose. Um, but I'm very, very disappointed with Obama. <clears throat> so if we'd had Gary Johnson or Jill Stein or any uncorrupt voice on that stage, People would have, way, would have come away at least thinking about some real problems as the two major candidates coyly smirk and smile, look at their shoes, because they know it's one of the taboo questions being asked. As you'll see when Ron Paul makes radical answers the, uh, in the Republican debates, the way that everyone looks at their shoes, it's almost like they're forbidden to think about it, or it's just funny that somebody's actually talking about something real, which you're not supposed to do. Am I losing my mind? Or is this an accurate impression? Please tell me.
One of those crazy questions outside of the bubble. We'll just smile and look at our shoes. Ha ha ha. So these debates create the veneer of a democracy, but their message is that politics is a domain where few choices exist. A little technocrats tweaking things around the edges. Uh, to not mention in the debate that the United States um, has uh, a military industrial system that is 50% uh, uh, of the world's military spending with 6% of the world's population and our economy is certainly not more than 15 or 20 percent of the world's gross domestic product, gross product. Uh, so we're shooting ourselves in the foot funding uh, military while other countries are building factories. So in 10 years their factories can make military stuff. We won't have any factories so they'll be able to kill us both ways, economically and militarily. We're bringing a knife to a gunfight and no one wants to talk about it. And I have a, a reasonably good presentation called Bringing a Knife to a Gunfight. You might want to look at to see how stupid it is militarily to spend money at this rate on the military when you're not in a full-scale war against a real enemy. Uh, this is a, really a police action with Al-Qaeda. It's something that in the old days Interpol would have solved or the FBI. It wouldn't have been the entire military. Okay. <clears throat> So these debates create the veneer of a democracy, but their message is that politics is a domain where few choices exist, and the problems in our system are essentially technocratic tweaking problems. They confuse people as to the, their own basic essential role as citizens. As uh, various intellectuals have said, I, I think it might have been Kurt Vonnegut, uh, no, it was, um, I think it was Bill Moyer who said that we've stopped becoming citizens, we've become consumers. And I'm going to get to that because from now on I'm going to give a solution in, which you don't have to listen to, but we can't just bitch. <clears throat> These de okay. <clears throat> if our leaders won't lay out the real issues, the U.S. has virtually bankrupted itself while enriching defense contractors, bankers, and big pharma, for example, and the press apparently won't ask any real questions and no one else is allowed to talk. These debates are a little better than Soviet debates, in my opinion. There they are, Jill Stein, Gary Johnson, needed voices, ready to put some real new blood and liveliness to the debate, which is a little better than going to a funeral home for excitement. But they're not allowed in. It makes me sick. What, uh, okay, so I wanted to briefly give you an example, if, if you don't agree with me, of uh, example of the kind of insanity we're dealing with here. We're a uh, very wonderful Mr. Jank Weger, normally quite a wonderful man. Killed, although he wasn't on the kill list. Oops. Right? So, a great question. What What is uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz's response? Get a load of this. President Romney becomes president. He's going to inherit President Barack Obama's secret kill list. This is going to be debated. How do you think Romney will handle this kill list, and are you comfortable with him having a kill list? I have no idea what you're talking about. Obama has a secret kill list, which he has used to assassinate different people all over the world. I'm happy to answer any serious questions. Why is that not serious? Because I have no idea what you're talking about. Of course you don't. <laughs> I gotta agree with him. <laughs> I mean, I think she was genuine. And she said, oh, look at this big paranoid conspiracy leftist <laughs> secret kill list. Was the New York Times report that? Oh, the administration leaked that? And the other clip he brings in here from a very uh, courageous young man, Luke. Um, I forget his last name. How does Obama justify uh, his flip-flop on the National Defense Authorization Act, especially the indefinite detention provision, which he said he never wanted, but he's now, the administration is appealing our order. I hear that as a subject of the debate tonight. What's your bottom line on the debate tonight? The bottom line on the debate tonight was I think President Obama had a decisive victory. Oh, I love that. So when it's someone who's actually asking a real question, yeah, dismiss, that wasn't in the debate. As long as both sides have agreed, that we are going to do indefinite detentions, and the media that sucks up to both of us has agreed that that's not a real issue and was not asked in the debate. Shut up, shut up, shut up. I'm not going to answer that. And then my second favorite part is then one of the media hacks asks her the exact question she wants, which is, what's your bottom line on the debate? Oh, that's a really probing question. Okay, wow. I can't wait to hear her talking point. And it turns out she thinks President Obama won decisively. You don't say. So, so there are certain rules to this game, and if you stick to the rules and you don't do 
your job as journalists and you ask stupid softball questions, they'll answer those all day long. You ask a really good question, a hard question about the National Defense Authorization Act, something that's really important. Say, no, no, uh, our lackeys in the press didn't ask that in the debate, so you don't get to ask it either. Okay. And another example of the kind of frustration that people have, uh, let's see if I can get it for you. Uh, he allowed the candidates to focus on domestic issues. This is about taking Bob Schieffer to task, moving far off topic from the original questions he posed. And of those questions, not one of them mentioned Obama's use of drones in Pakistan and Yemen, Guantanamo Bay, the National Defense Authorization Act. Okay, so now it's solution time. So this is uh, what I propose to you to get us out of this mess in a nutshell. I think we have to use local businesses that are voluntary and opt-in, organized similar to credit unions and cooperatives to deal with necessities so that we don't have any economic alienation. Unfortunately, real solutions are complicated and hard to explain. But I have this website, and I sincerely am not trying to self-promote. I have just promised myself I'm not going to leave people with no answers and just complain. So if you go to this website, this describes the four quadrants of the economy. Productive, non-productive, functional, non-functional. So for, we want everyone to be functional and productive. They, are, um, they haven't been so screwed up by society that they can't function, and they're not working doing something wasteful. So an example of the non-productive yet functional is the welfare warfare state, the non-productive non-functional are, uh, I hate to just put them all in a category, the welfare class, the productive non-functional might be people that are really screwed up but are working in industries that actually produce something of real value. So this is what I call libertarian communitarianism. And there are leftists uh, and rightists who have ideas along these lines. Um, so basically you have a, uh, a, a necessity economy and you have a, uh, a optional economy. So tonight, uh, you can go and look at some of the uh, ideas there and I have to clean it up and so forth. But I went through every occupation in the U.S. and here's the basic thesis. Uh, we need utility industries that people can be members of. So you can use either labor or money. Uh, similar to credit union or cooperative, for basic necessities, so that you don't have any want. Want in the old word, sense of the word, W-O-N-T, meaning that you're not lacking anything. Therefore, you don't need to uh, get, uh, uh, you can sustain and reproduce your existence, and no one can evict you off your land, no one can take your food away from you, uh, no one can force you to have your child push through a substandard education or jail you if you choose to educate them in a different manner. Freedom, economic and personal freedom. This necessity economy only takes a small percent of our workforce. It depends on how you dial it in, but between 15 and 25 percent of our workforce, that is to say 15 to 25 percent of a full-time job per co-op member. And by securing these resources, anxiety is eliminated. So what are these resources? Well, first of all, housing. Uh, I would propose we have a program where everyone raise barns until every single person in their community owns their basic primary dwelling. They can have a huge mortgage on their secondary dwelling or call it their secondary dwelling that they have the barn raising on, but they have one place they can live that they can never be tossed off of and don't have to pay any taxes on as long as certain social goals are met because if you take away property taxes education collapses so what you have to do is essentially offer free private education that is free opt-in education and in exchange no property taxes if the private education system doesn't meet the goals it doesn't allow universal uh, 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 enrollment uh, and its scoring systems uh, be fall below some average baseline nationally then all the taxes would come in to these primary domiciles, primary houses. So everyone would own their own house, there would be no loan on it, and there would be no taxes. So you would never experience housing insecurity. Okay, one. Two, farmland, meaning uh, the ability to eat, um, access to some kind of a farming cooperative, so you can never starve, and you can never be fed toxic food. Um, and then make your own local power. 
here in the Bay Area and California, we could generate a lot of solar power. We have, uh, if, if we're going to be willing to frack, we got so much natural gas, it's not funny. We could make, uh, you can convert current cars into hybrid cars, electric cars. Uh, 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 you can convert current cars into liquid uh, propane driven cars. So you don't have to buy gas from the big companies because the big companies have failed us. And you don't have to buy gas uh, overseas to fuel military industrial system. You can make your own energy. You can grow your own energy. And you can take used vehicles and build some lightweight manufacturing in your community to modify them to run on the type of energy you're capable of producing. And then third, the medical research university. Uh, uh, we need a cooperative medical system where people are able to volunteer their labor in order to receive medical services. And this medical research university should sponsor uh, the K-12 system. It should be a K-20 system, um, but it should be a cooperative. So people can either uh, trade labor for the services or they can pay a fee for the services. So that means instead of working 15 to 25 percent time to receive your necessities, you could simply pay your dues to receive uh, these things and you could go and work a normal job. This is not communism because these are voluntary structures and you're free to uh, start businesses, uh, do anything as wasteful as you like. It's a system to eliminate anxiety so people can't lose their jobs in the sense that you can't become homeless, you can't lose your food, you can't lose your education, you can't lose your medical care. Now people could always be granted us by the federal government perhaps, but it uh, it's larded. Why? Because the further accountability moves away from the person paying for it, the more likely corruption will enter. And systems have scale issues. You talk about economies of scale. Uh, but the economy of scale, which is that as you get larger, I don't know if you want to make this sort of triangle, but let's say you make it, as you get larger, you get more efficient, but at a certain point, there's a point of diminishing returns, okay? And that's where we're at, because with computerization and uh, Wikipedia and uh, so forth, we don't need to have giant indus smokestack industries to have an economy of scale. We can have micro economies of scale. We can have micro foundries. You can have a, a, a manufacturing line that uh, uh, bangs out 12 of one part, 100 of the next part, 30 of the next part, and it's all computerized. And the goal is to eliminate work, not to create jobs. We don't need jobs. We need resources. Then you're going to need a certain amount of basic manufacturing, most likely, in a system like this, to drive the rest of it. You can't very well raise barns if you don't have any planks. And uh, let's see here. Then we eliminate taxes by and large and kick them back if any of these communitarian libertarian solutions uh, fail to produce at least a result equal to our current system. And this can all be done with, a, with as I said, a 15 and 25 percent uh, labor contribution. We can get away from having society driven by anxiety. You have an anxiety to consume and you have fear. You fear you lose your job, you lose your health care, you're going to lose your house, you're going you're gonna to be eating toxic food, you're going to get locked up in Guantanamo. So you eliminate fear and cravings. And then let's see what happens. Um, and why? So the necessity economy only takes a small percentage of our workforce. That is, that is a small percentage of our time. By securing these resources, anxiety is eliminated. Our whole system is based on induced feelings of lack and insecurity. It's what Marx, Karl Marx, called alienation. He got radicalized when he studied the, uh, the uh, small peasants in England. The big landowners found out that sheep were more profitable than peasants. Does this sound familiar? So they turned all the peasants off the land to raise wool. And then they made it illegal to be homeless. They branded them all with V for vagrant. In the forehead, in some cases, they made it a crime to be uh, a bum. They, um, this drove Marx crazy, but this basic concept of alienation, which is that we don't have any root, we're rootless people that are at the uh, uh, at the control, then there are these large forces that we can't control that decide what we can do. You know, I have my own business, and I just feel so bad for a lot of people I know who are fine people and have screwed up work situations. They have no 
to me, it's almost like having no dignity to work for someone else. And in the 19th century, there were there were wise uh, man who said that Americans must never sell their time, but should sell their services. We should all essentially be business people and not wage slaves. <clears throat> If we have basic local community and utility industries, we can ignore the entire consumerist. We can ignore the entire consumerist machine and refuse to work beyond these utility industries, draining the swamp, Washington, by simply not funding it, not really caring if it collapses. At this point, the federal government's debt is not your problem. You don't care. Every country in the world is in this boat. This doesn't just apply to the United States. This is the same as true in every country, particularly countries like Spain right now. The big corporations pay themselves enormous bonuses. As a libertarian, that's their right, as long as they aren't uh, using corruption, which unfortunately is usually the case. And this brings me to my other point, is that I believe we can restore the resource base. So you've got 40 acres and a mule to kickstart a, a, a time when people are like the Jeffersonian yeoman, which is you are proud, sovereign person at no one else's mercy. In the, old, in the ideal Jeffersonian household, and these did exist in great numbers, you had a family farm, you had a family business. And between those two, they used a business so they could go out and buy luxuries. I'm not talking about primitivism. I'm talking about a 21st century vision that uh, encompasses some of these ideas, which are good ideas, which is the dignity of the freeholder. And if you are a wage slave, you're not a freeholder. If you have a government sucking you dry and endangering you, you're not a freeholder. We need to, at the minimum, be Jeffersonian freeholders. For God's sake, there were, you know, 40% of the American public at minimum, you know, around 1800. Uh, not, un not for the unfortunate uh, slaves, uh, but for the, uh, the citizens. <sighs> So these big corporations, uh, my goal, the ones that have uh, uh, achieved this through fraud, we should fine them back all the money they owe us and restore it to the people. So they, they pay themselves enormous bonuses, they eliminate positions, they fund this democracy strangling media and political monoculture masquerading as choice. Pepsi or Coke, San Quentin or Sing Sing, don't buy their products, don't pay their taxes, and it can be done legally. And the start is we have to create communitarian, libertarian, cooperative structures or something analogous to it. I look forward to hearing your thoughts. My name is Alexander Hagen. Good night and good luck.